and it's now my pleasure to introduce and to welcome the rector of Tallinn University, the, our, our local host, Professor Tiet Land. Dear Rechtust, good evening, dear colleagues, dear guests, dear friends. On behalf of Tallinn University, I am very happy to welcome you to um, Estonia, to our beautiful capital of Estonia, to Tallinn, and uh, last but not least, to Tallinn University. This conference is uh, really extraordinary. This is a remarkable event for Tallinn University. This is um, the biggest conference we ever had, and um, of course I am very happy about that. I think this event is also um, uh, remarkable for, uh, for Estonia, because Estonia is um, such a small country, and having so many people from all over the world here discussing um, uh, about different um, uh, things is uh, very, very nice. Uh, I assume that most of you are, are in Estonia first time, so um, just a few words about uh, our country and also about our university. Well, as I mentioned, Estonia is a um, small country. Well, it's not a small country, it's a very small country. Our, our population is just um, uh, slightly over one million, which is um, well, like a, um, an average city in um, Europe or uh, United States or small village or average village in uh, China. Um, our um, uh, territory is roughly, um, uh, well, I'm coming from the uh, southeastern part of Estonia and we're right now in the northwestern part of Estonia and it's only three hours drive. Uh, we have in Estonia um, about, today we have about uh, 60,000, 60,000 students. Uh, which is about 40% of the population of the age group between 20 and 24. And as uh, it was mentioned, Tallinn University is um, the th third largest in terms of number of students. So we have uh, about 10,000 students. Um, Tallinn University is also, um, we were very, ha very happy about being an international university. We have um, one of the highest percentage of um, uh, foreign staff, which is uh, just below 10%. And I believe that the um, Department of Anthropology of Tallinn University is even more international, or perhaps the most international um, uh, unit in, in Estonia. So um, I would like to wish you um, uh, fruitful discussions, uh, nice meetings, uh, workshops, uh, laboratories, and I hope that uh, you also will have time to uh, go around in Tallinn, because our campus is located or situated basically in downtown. Uh, it's only 10 minutes walking distance to our beautiful medieval old town. And um, don't worry about the weather. It's today, the, this uh, thunder shower or the sh uh, shower we had uh, this afternoon is, uh, is nothing unusual. Uh, what was unusual is uh, that in the middle of uh, June we had snow. And um, uh, on midsummer uh, night, the temperature was just like uh, during the Christmas uh, night or Christmas Eve. So don't worry, tomorrow it will be nice again. And enjoy uh, your stay in, uh, in Estonia, enjoy our um, food, uh, our drinks, our culture. And uh, once again, you are very, very welcome to Tallinn University. Thank you. Next, I welcome to the floor one of the driving forces behind uh, this conference, Carlo Cubero from the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology. Hi. So, um, hello all. Um, I'm Carlo. And on behalf of the local committee, I would like to welcome you all to Tallinn and thank you for making it over. Um, the anthropology, in the anthropology department here, I am the coordinator of the MA program. Um, one of the most exciting expectations that we have with this conference is the possibility to network and promote our program, our students, the researchers, Estonian talents, and promote our projects. So, we are a very new department. We were founded in 2006. And in this short period of time, I think we have developed a very clear research profile. 
which is manifest in our publications, events, projects, and in the projects of our students and the researchers that are, that are based here. And we're all very proud of them. This conference gives us a platform where we can showcase the department, our facilities, and the city. And we hope, really hope, that some of you would be encouraged to consider Estonia as a base, as a site to carry out your field work, your library work, or your writing up and do some teaching in our department while, while, while you're at it. <laughs> I've been here five years, and uh, I find Estonia in general, and Tallinn in particular, to be a great place to work in. Um, the agenda that all students and staff share in our department is the idea that we are building a department, that we are part of a team that is setting up a working environment where people can collaborate in their creative endeavors. This generates amongst all of us a, a strong sense of shared responsibility for the program and for the department. And this is, this is a very different approach um, that you'll find from long established research or teaching programs that perhaps would be more focused in delivering a service. And an effect of this approach is that it produces a very high level of motivation and initiative in our students that this motivation goes beyond the classroom. And I'd like to share two examples uh, of, of this high degree of motivation. Our students have been active participants in every EASA through either volunteering or presenting since the Ljubljana conference in 2008, where incidentally a bunch of them hitchhiked there from Tallinn, it took them two days. Now, in fact, the success of the Ljubljana conference was what gave us the confidence to put in our bid. You know, because we figured if they could do it, we could do it better. <laughs> I didn't write that, that just came. Our, <laughs> Our students have founded a non-for-profit organization that organizes seasonal school events where colleagues and friends from our neighboring countries and neighboring departments are invited to attend. The NGO also organizes a series of outreach programs in local schools here in Tallinn, and they're designed to promote anthropology and to encourage secondary school students to consider anthropology as an option of study. And it has effect. Every year we get two or three students that come, come to our program because of these outreach programs that our students do. As for the staff's research, our own research, our department is housed within the Humanities Institute. So this contextualizes our anthropology as a conversation between semiotics, comparative literature, philosophy. There is also a strong correspondence going on between the Art Academy and the Baltic Film and Media School. A result of this conversation and this continuous correspondence, um, I would like to announce that this September um, we're going to inaugurate an MA, within our MA we're going to have a track and we're calling it Audiovisual Ethnography, where researcher, graduate researchers that, that, that make Estonia Italian their base can work with non-textual media as a means to carry out and present their, their research. The initial response to this program has been very, very positive. To give an illustration, for the, for the first time in our short history, our MA has become competitive, and we've actually had to turn down very good applications that we, that, that we have received. Um, some of the projects that are already linked to this program look into the possibility of sound works, photography, animation, museum curatorships, and of course, cinema as a means to produce anthropological knowledge. Um, and so, uh, I would like to encourage you to have a look at our website, where you're going to find all the general information on the different programs that we have in Estonia. They fund postdocs, they fund research visits, paid exchanges. Um, you'll notice on our, on our website that we're a very small department. And this generates a very intimate environment with, between students and staff, and it's a very, very collegial environment. But it also suggests that we are understaffed. And my point is that we are constantly looking for people that will be up for coming for a visit and contribute to the building of our, of our department. We have been working on this event for a bit over two years. Our team is mostly composed of uh, locally based anthropologists as well as colleagues from, from Latvia. And as you can imagine, the amount of excitement and expectation that is generated when you work on something with such intensity for such a long period of time, you can just imagine the, the, the excitement that this generates. And this excitement is, has spread, and it has generated a buzz 
in the humanities and the social science scene in, in Estonia. There are many panels and papers and labs that are being done by friends and colleagues based in the Baltics. And I, I hope that you really separate some time to, to check them out. Um, um, don't be shy about approaching them, buying them a drink, or striking a conversation, because we're all dying to meet you and dying to get, get to know you better. So on that note, I um, wish you a great conference. We've put a lot of effort in designing a stimulating program, the films, the labs, the panels, and of course, the social programs. We put a lot of effort into that. So go to the parties, take a tour of the city, and get to, to, get to know the town. It's a, it's a great city. And once again, thanks for coming. Cheers. I forgot one thing. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jeanette Edwards from the University of Manchester, my former pro uh, professor when I was based there in Manchester. Jeanette, Professor Edwards is the Vice President of the EASA. Applause. Hello. Okay, I'm delighted to um, have been asked to do the introduction to Elizabeth Povinelli. She's Franz Boas Professor of Anthropology and Gender Studies at Columbia University, author of four monographs and a great number of academic articles, a filmmaker, and a prolific, and dare I say, elegant, blogger. Professor Povinelli is also a true public intellectual with a long-term political commitment to the people with whom she's worked and collaborated as an anthropologist over three decades, be it with radical fairies in upstate New York or Belluan communities in northwest Australia. I think it's fair to say that she's an international reputation as a scholar of cutting edge and critical commentary on late liberalism and has prodded and pushed our understanding of the interfaces and impasses between settler and indigenous people in significant and unsettling ways. Her four books, Labour's Lot, The Cunning of Recognition, Economies of Abandonment and The Empire of Love, are soon to be joined by another book with the working title, Geontologies, a Requiem to Late Liberalism. This is third in a trilogy that sheds light on how contemporary liberal discourse on diverse and other social worlds, a discourse that recognizes difference, in practice disguises culpability for the slow but inexorable diminishing of the life worlds and possibilities of communities on the margins. But her work, while unsettling, is not without hope. And in her own practice, for example in collaborations with the Caribbean Indigenous Corporation, she shows how it could be otherwise. She writes in the introduction, to the empire of love, and I quote, my goal is not to say yes or no to individual freedom and social constraint, the intimate event or the genealogical society. All I can hope is that by understanding how these discourses work to shape social life, we can begin to formulate a positive political program, something I've begun to describe as a politics of thick life, in which the density of social representation is increased to meet the density of actual social worlds." End of quote. Her film, Low Tide Turning, co-directed and co-written with Lisa Johnson and the Caribbean Indigenous Corporation, was selected for the Berlinale International Film Festival short competition in 2012. And she'll leave us here in Estonia, sadly too soon, to further that project and shoot the sequel to the sequel or part of the longer story when the dogs talked, of which low tide turning is but a part. 
It really is a delight to welcome Elizabeth Povinelli as keynote to the IASA 13th Biennial Conference, marking the association's 25th year with a theme of collaboration, intimacy and revolution. She embodies all three of these social material concepts that will orientate and animate, but not constrain, our discussion over the next three days. We are very honoured to have her set the conference in motion, notwithstanding the panels that have already done that. So thank you, Elizabeth Povinelli. The floor is yours. <laughs> oh, after you do this a little while, you, you hate those kinds of introductions because you're just set up to really fail. <laughs> um, it's a real great pleasure to be here. I, I haven't been to Estonia before, um, and so I have not been to Tallinn. Uh, so I want to begin by thanking um, a ESA, uh, the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology, and Tallinn University for organizing this conference and inviting me uh, to speak with you today. Uh, I want to start with two seemingly very trivial notes. First, I've changed my title. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it was. Honestly, I have no idea. Um, but whatever it was, it's now called Collaboration, Alteration, Investigation. In large part because I, I've tried to write this talk today for you and the conference, rather than just, you know, give a paper that I've written for something else. Um, second, uh, I'm flying back to New York after the conference, and actually before the conference ends. Um, and then after a day and a half, I'm going to fly to the top end of the Northern Territory of Australia, as uh, Jeannie noted, to begin shooting the third project of the Kottabing Film Collective. The Film Collective is a social project within the Kottabing Indigenous Corporation. And the Kottabing Indigenous Corporation consists of about 30 indigenous men and women, and myself, who range in age from the late 50s, because that's pretty much how old you are um, if you're indigenous in Australia. Men die in their early 50s on average, and women in their mid to late 60s. And, but it ranges from I'm 52, just to, well, I don't know why you need to know that. Um, uh, it shows from the late 50s to really the newborn, although in, uh, according to federal corporation law um, in Australia, you can't be a member of the indigenous, Kottabing Indigenous Corporation until you're 15. And I should say that the corporation was founded in 2008. Now a, ooh, now here we go, first going. Oh, you know what, I never thought this would be the problem. Hello, and welcome to the stage. Give a big hand to our tech people. I'll make another bad joke. Where'd you find your scroller? Okay, you do it while I'm talking. Um, as you'll see, as soon as we get this going, a social anthropologist could easily demonstrate the matrifocal nature of the Kottabing Indigenous Corporation and certainly the film collective. Um, but Kottabing is an environmental term rather than being a territorial or 
kinship term or kinship and descent. Cottabing means low tide. It means when the tide is the furthest out. So um, the Cottabing are on the coastal area of the Northern Territory. And Cottabing, which is tied out, is often paired or is paired semantically with Cottacall, tied up. So it's the two points of the tide. Cottabing members have known each other their entire lives, having been born and raised in a small indigenous community called Belluin. And Cottabing members and I, also being a Cottabing member, have known each other for 30 years this September. And since, in my writing at least, I'm not very reflexive in the 1980 sense of reflexive ethnography, I should say that this knowing each other, that is, me and them and them, is based on year in and year out, two, three, four times a year, um, me going and coming. So, and while I'm there, of course, we live together, we raise kids together, we poach cattle together, we go to court together. You know, I don't mean poach in a bucket. You know what a poaching, okay. Um, we go to court together and we share resources, including money, um, although, of course, unevenly together. We also now make films together. Do you mind my companions here? <laughs> Is this like working? <laughs> that is beautiful. Okay, awesome. All right, now we just click. Okay, so anyways, here we go. Oops, let's pretend this is gonna work. Click. Do anything? Click. Why am I clicking? Click. Oh, click? Okay. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. So anyway, sorry, this was, I was thinking, oh, I should show you how you could look at a matrifocal. So you can see there, right? If I had a little pointer, I'd show you. See, up in that top square is Ruby Yerwin, and it's, it's a lot of her um, children, um, uh, their partners, um, their children, uh, mainly through, it's interesting, mainly through a focus on and around uh, Ruby. Um, okay, so as I noted, so now we make films together. So we have done a lot of things. We've done land claims together. We've done a lot of things together. Now, uh, as I noted in Empire of Love and later in uh, Economy's Abandonment, when I refer to us, we've done things together, uh, it's important, and I think, for what we're doing here uh, this weekend, this long weekend, to remember that we um, are a unified group from the perspective of the projects um, that we do together and the diverse background worlds we've made together making these projects. But we, that is me and them, and people within the them, them and them, are also divided, and divided by all sorts of uh, ways. All of our affective attachments and anxieties are indeed very different, even as we analyze and talk about each other all the time. And of course, when I leave Australia, I leave, uh, I enter a very different set of localities and demanding environments than they do. That is, the we, whatever this thing is, this collaboration, flicker in and out. Um, but I'm going to suggest that it doesn't flicker in and out like the Heisenberg cat. You put it in, it's there. You open, sorry, you open the box, it's there. You close the box. No, what do you do? You open, it's there. You close it, it's not. No, you open it, you close it, you open it. Right. Sometimes there and sometimes not. The point is, and the point I think we're going to be trying to make this... Uh, over the course of these uh, uh, sessions is that the cat itself changes. So it's not just whether the cat's there, but the cat itself changes as you open and close the box. Um, so let me say a little bit about um, uh, or two. Um, a couple of things about the films that we're doing, um, just to give you a richer sense of what at least I'm going to start talking about in terms of collaboration. The film we're shooting in August is tentatively titled The Waves. It tells the story of a group of indigenous men and women who are living at the top end of the Northern Territory of Australia on the coast, whose sons and nephews are arrested for stealing two cartons of beer, which they find in the bush 
and um, after their uh, two older uh, male re relatives call the cops on them because the younger kids are harassing them as these older men are working on a mine in order to pay off some fines. So the, it starts with this vignette of two cartons of beer. You see these young men coming in. You find out they've been making sure no one came back for the beer. They start drinking, they get pissed, they pee off a cliff. And then you look and you see two older indigenous men doing what appear to be painting secret, sacred things, only to find that they are actually painting warning blasting area. As the young, and oh, these young men then, they call the, the, they're harassing and throwing beer at each other. And the, the older men call the cops and the young men run into a swamp, but it's in this contaminated area from the mines. Now, as the young men and the families who gather around the swamp and the miners and the police argue and negotiate about um, how to get these kids out, what the story attempts to do is tell a much broader um, story about the, if you want, the dreaming, the cyclical nature of the confrontation between indigenous people and extractive capital. So the way the, a lot of people put it in Cotter being if race, uh, sorry, if the dreaming goes round and round in cyclical time, so is colonialism and racism. Through the hallucinations of one of the young thieves, the wave's able to move back and forward in time to show that the dreaming and colonialism are now permanent features of their landscape. And we have these weird ghost scenes. Okay. This film is the third project. Um, the first two films, the first a very short, a short film that uh, Jeannie mentioned. And then we incorporated that short into a longer film. And that longer film was called, it's not really long, it's like 30 minutes, called When the Dogs Talk. And When the Dogs Talk tells the story of an extended indigenous family who, faced with losing their public housing if they don't find a missing relative, embark on a journey to the bush to find her, only to wind up stranded on, on an outstation. As their parents argue about whether to save their government housing or their sacred landscape, a group of the younger indigenous kids struggle to decide how the, what sense the dreaming now makes in their lives. And in particular, this dog dreaming. This, what anthropologists would call a totem. They used to call that. The Cotabing conceive, and it's important, they conceive, stage, and act out these films. And we do it together, so I'm in Cotterbing. And then various people are assigned various roles, depending on what they want to do. So most people act. Some people do um, uh, uh, lighting. And I've been assigned the role of director. I can't imagine why. Cameraman, soundmen, and visiting directors outside the group are, are pulled in to volunteer Although some are the direct, the visiting directors are volunteers, although the cameraman, the sound man, um, or woman, mainly actually they've been men, are hired to do the work, in large part because members of the Cotterbang wanted to film object product that looked to them like a movie, like a, what they said, a real movie, or a television show, and so they wanted to learn how, this, how, how these things are made. As with, uh, where's three, good, how these things are made, okay, mm, this is, here we go, okay, so, these films emerged out of an earlier Cotterbing project, or at least the uh, Cotterbing idea for a project, and this is what I was going to talk about today, that is, the films emerged out of a new media project. Oops. Come on, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, earlier, a film media project, I mean, sorry, a GPS, GIS new media project, which is easy to describe, easy enough. What they wanted to do was to take media files about their country, the history, the landscape. Give them a GPS tag, so that's one of the Cotterbing um, crew. Uh, give the media, make a GPS, you know, coordinate. Geotag the, put, uh, oh, wow. Wow, yeah, put a, put a geo, uh, geotag the media file. Did something happen? 
Did it? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Geotag it. Um, so that when a person came to a site on the country, they would get a little ding on their smartphone. I love that. I don't know where that is. You get a little ding on their smartphone, you'd hit it, and what you would see was the actual place you were, but also a media file on top of it, one of, uh, one of which could say something like, this country doesn't belong to you. The software in this uh, G GPS GIS project, this uh, uh, digital new media project, would create three unique interfaces, one for tourists, one for land management, and one for the indigenous members of the Katabing themselves. The latter, the Katabing, would have management authority over the entire project and content. And we were imagining that it would have some kind of dynamic feedback loop for the input of new information and media. As neither traditional nor modern, and yet both, the social vision of this virtual library, this virtual archive, this new media digital, um, uh, this new digital media, uh, was the social vision of it was very clear. The transmedia, the new digital, what, what exactly it is, we, we didn't know, quite know at the time. But this new project would allow the Katabing to embed their geontological principles, that, that is their idea that in order to know a place, you have to be in the place to embed their geontological principles and practices in cutting-edge communicative technologies, allowing them to access information eco economies as they learn about these information economies, and allowing them to engage with their increasingly tech-savvy children. A selling part to those who would finance this thing was that it was an environmentally friendly, supposedly, business in which the impact on the landscape would be quite low. And this is important because, in, as I'll say in a minute, um, the major use of indigenous land in Australia right now is mining. So why, um, why a old media, why did, a, why did a new media, why did we start this new media project? I guess is the first question. On the one hand, that vision was there. On the other hand, for someone like me, because everyone has and everyone gets to have their interest in these projects, thinking through these new digital media allowed us to, and me, to think through how it is that different sectors or different communities, marginalized or otherwise, are able to access and find entry into what Hart and Agree have famously turned the uh, termed immaterial labor of the capitalism we're, in, uh, it, we're currently in. For those of you who don't know, um, very quickly, Negri and Hart, for Negri and Hart, immaterial labor refers to the uh, sorry, informationalization, I love that, informationalization of capital that came about when the service sector broke free of the service sector reorganizing and re-signifying the labor process as a whole. For them, the result of the service sector breaking free of its own little sector and becoming the general pattern was that the industry, the service industry, can no longer be thought of as merely referring to low-wage burger and coffee shop employment or call service center employees. The service section for them, or sector, now refers to the entire reorientation of labor production and consumption, including the financial sector, as dependent on information and communication technologies that are oriented to learning about and responding to the desires of others. Right. So this, this, this immaterial labor is the way in which it's material, but the way in which capitalism is now formed around this reorientation of labor production and co um, consumption uh, to information and its communicative technologies for learning about the, and responding to the desires of others. This information communication network includes commu communication between software and machines, and between commodities and market desires. And it doesn't matter the concrete technology itself. All sorts of technologies of information 
uh, information collection are deployed, including new algorithms that mine buying habits, paper slips distributed in hotels mark give us feedback, Facebook and Twitter feeds. What matters to Hart and Agree, and what I, we thought this project would really um, both do and analyze, what matters is that the heart of this new logic of labor, that this, what they call these effective informational loops, are orient, oriented toward capturing the desire of the other so that capital can insinuate itself ever more exactly, ever more anticipatorily, ever more intimately into our worlds. Now, but rather viewing what's, you know, what was controversial and interesting about all of this was that rather than viewing immaterial labor as the last locked door of the prison house of capital, Hart and Agree saw it as providing, quote, the potential for a kind of spontaneous and elementary commun communism within capitalism. This is for the simple reason that they thought that cooperation and mutually oriented affect, the hallmark qualities of what they understood to be elementary communism, are for them completely imminent of, to the laboring acti activity of this kind of labor, this kind of immaterial labor. As opposed to what they understood as just coordination of a previous form of labor. That is, they, where we might say collaboration, they were at that time saying cooperation and mutually oriented affect. We why we want to know what you desire, and so we can orient to you. And he's saying actually, they are saying actually that orientation in and of itself could be radicalized. So, why aren't we doing this new media project? Since. It, in, in the way in which we envisioned it together, and we kind of, and I'll come back to that, um, we would learn, we would gain entrance to information that is how, how these systems work. They would get um, educated in this new informationalized economy. Um, we would then market and tap into it, and et cetera. So why aren't we doing it? The Cotta being conceived, well, there's one, one answer. The Cotta being conceived and tried to finance the development of this project, this GPS, GIS project, at the very moment when financial markets crashed, that is, around the same time they incorporated, 2008. As you know, in 2008, then after the financial cra crash, recessions gripped the US and Europe. Um, but Australia, on the other hand, weathered this capital crisis by becoming ever more reliant on one sector of the economy, that is, mineral extraction. By 2012, a quarter of its exports, or 5% of its GDP, went to China, and 60% of those shipments were a single commodity, iron ore. As a result, the Australian dollar increased in value. This happens with in commodity booms and mining booms. The Australian dollar increased in value, making my contributions shrink up and stifling other export industries and stifling the import of tourism, which made the nation's growth ever more dependent on mining and gas extraction. Mining in Australia, primarily in the north, happens on indigenous land. And mining is quick money, easy money, and it's strongly advocated by the, uh, the, northern, uh, the various land councils that were established in the 1970s to claim indigenous land, but now are now trying to manage them and make capital out of them. With the average yearly income for indigenous persons hovering around $10,000, any additional income is quite seductive. I mean, you can pay your bills and pay your fines and et cetera. And given the structure of land governance that was established in the 70s under this anthropological imaginary of, as I'm, uh, of a descent group, a kinship group linked to territory, which again, the Cotabing are not, many people who are recognized as, quote, traditional owners of a country have no knowledge or interest in the land They've never been there. It's often because of colonial displacement very far away. And they can easily outvote people who don't have, um, don't want to mine, who have a, a different interest in, the, in these companies. And these mining companies know this, as do the managers and employees of the land councils that should be, I think, doing something else. 
So right when we we're beginning to start this new media project, we have financial collapse, we have ever-increasing reliance on mining for generating income for uh, indigenous men and women in the north. And we have then the collapse of any financing that would take to build the software in order to make the project. But something else happened. It became clear that if we were going to, and they were going to, this is if, if the Cotterbing were going to build their land, if they were going to have a GPS project that said being on country was important to knowing about country, then they actually had to build that view into the human world, um, and especially in the world of their kids. And so, if the purpose was to make that kind of social world, it didn't really matter what project we did. Or, it didn't matter, and again, here when, when we're thinking about the new media, it didn't really matter if it was new media or old media, and it's wound up, I think, that it actually might be better that it was, quote, old media, that is, film, although it's digitalized and everything, obviously. Why am I telling you all this? On their surface, both of these social projects, the GPS project, GPS GIS project, and the film initiative, or the film collective, seem exemplary of the kinds of collaborations in which this conference is in interested. All I have to do was read from the digital abstract of the conference, and where I would find the hope, I think it's a hope, well, it's a statement, but it's kind of a hopeful statement, I suppose, that, quote, collaboration, as a set of relations of intimacy opens up conceptual spaces to explore the basic terms of our contemporary world, including social and political change, community, kinship, social networks, activism, and digital media. This same abstract for the conference stages this concept of collaboration, intimacy, revolution, but I think you know, collaboration, for me at least, is the key term here. The same abstract stages the concept of collaboration as a shift or a turn from an older model of practicing anthropology or an older method of doing anthropology based on, and again I quote, quote, as a way out, so this is going to be a way out of certain theoretical and methodological deadlocks in which many anthropologists have found themselves in the past decade, unquote. Deadlocks. Ah, oh, the deadlocks. Perhaps attention to the collective and collaborative tasks of making meaning can push us through the deadlocks. Those deadly deadlocks of structural functionalism, the deadlocks of postmodern nihilism, the deadlocks of scientific rationalism, all are in the, in the, suggested in the abstract. So let me pay laborious attention for a moment to the concept of collaboration. And then I'm going to come back to these projects. As we know, if in the English language, and I, don't, I also don't know Estonia, um, collaboration comes from the turn, from, sorry, comes from the Latin morphemes call and labora, to labor together. But these definitions and any etymology that we can get out of the OED or elsewhere are not what a concept should do. It's no good for me to stand up here, and you know how people do You stand up and you say, I went to the dictionary and I find all these ways I can play with this word. But definitions and etymologies are not what a concept does or should do. A concept, to borrow a proposal from Deleuze, is something that generates a thought appropriate to its place in an in, uh, imminent order. That is, a concept should, is, is intended to do work, and do work in the world in which it is emerging. The concept of collaboration as simply two bodies standing side by side, each hitting an anvil with their respective hammer, is far too weak for what we're after here, I think. I hit, then you hit, then I hit the anvil. I am here as I was before I started hitting. There are you, the same as you were before you started. To be sure, I hit, then you hit, then I hit the anvil makes a difference in the kind, uh, uh, 
the kind of force present um, makes a difference than if I just hit it alone, or you did. That is, the potential foreign power is either accent, uh, accentuated or attenuated. But surely the concept of collaboration cannot simply be whether two things working together accentuate or attenuate force. Right? That would be, I think, more like coordination. I think what we want here is a concept that would entail something more like an alteration, and thus my second term in the talk, alter, uh, collaboration, alteration, investigation. What we want is a concept that would entail something more like an alteration that comes about as two or more previously um, distinct objects or subjects start to engage in something like a mutual labor. We have obvious examples of the kind of alteration that occurs in kinds of collaborations in intellectual scenes. We can almost go anywhere, but take, for instance, the written collaborations of Deleuze and Guattari. There's a marvelous, actually a marvelous biography of the pair as when they're writing as an intersection, so not, not something they were before, by the uh, historian of French structuralism, Francois Dosset. Of course, each man, Deleuze and Guattari or Freud and Bohr or whoever, um, each man wrote before he wrote with the other, and Deleuze wrote many things after. But they became someone other as they wrote together, and they stayed someone other after they ceased to do so. And this for the simple reason, I think, as Bakhtin and Peirce noted long ago, words aren't ours in the first place nor do they belong to the dictionary where neutral structural difference reigns. All words instead begin somewhere for everyone. They exist first as a specific environment and then they grow depending on where and with whom and when and what force and intensity their possibilities for use for making come into play. Thus, even if we don't see two names on a book, all of our writing is continually altered through, with, and by others before we enter in to or can be nominated as a collaborator. I'm collaborating with so-and-so. And I try to make it very clear, especially in economies of abandonment, that you know, my thought is not the same as my collaborator's thought, but it's not mine. It's not something that just miraculously sprung from my brain. Indeed, thinking of collaboration as you hit, then I hit, I wrote this word, you wrote that word, succumbs to a certain kind of nominal and epidermal fallacy, epidermal skin. The way our skin seems to separate us from other skin things and the way a proper or class name that these names bind together in order to produce two kinds of things. Instead, if we think of collaboration as alteration or if we think, if I think, if we think it's this alteration, sorry, that the concept of collaboration here, especially collaboration understood vis-a-vis -vis intimacy, seeks to elaborate, then something much more interesting happens. If we think of collaboration as an alteration or an internal alter alteration, that is, you know, it's not I hit, you hit. then we can see this internal alteration that we're talking about as creating all kinds of possible object-subject things. I myself think the kind of alteration that collaboration is, collaboration, intimate collaboration is, can't be contained within the imaginary of Aristotle's notion of potentiality. And, you know, why start there? But because these are the tools we have 
as a shared, often as shared. So it's not something like it's a thing, it's an acorn, right? It has the potential to become an oak. That is, it's in there, it goes up or not. Nor is it a kind of high, uh, Hegel's re-grabbing of Aristotle and making it into in which, you know, the, the uh, externalization and becoming actual of Geist continually absorbs the other and its opposite into its own self-identity. Rather, the kind of alteration that I think collaboration makes is more like, though we're going to see not, a assemblage in a kind of Deleuzean way, because it's an assemblage that is this kind of alteration Collaboration is alteration. It's a kind of assemblage, if you want, that comes to know or experience its fundamental non-unity. That is, it's, it's an assemblage that is not quite there. Even as, whatever this thing we're going to say, opens itself to being affected or obligated by having come together. That is, I don't think what we're, when we think about collaboration as alteration, we can think through the new vitalisms that, say, uh, my very good colleague and very smart colleague, Jane Bennett, has done, in which we merely shift the unity of the subject from the human organism or the object thing as that which has normative agency in the world shift it from that to an assemblage as norm, that is, just make it a bigger, more complicated assemblage. We, what we can't do, I think, is simply attribute the same qualities to the assemblage that have been attributed to, or, to organisms, like the human self, the person. That is, we need something, if we're going to talk about co collaboration as alteration in, in a meaningful and interesting way, I think, and I love these. These are this guy, Mark. I don't know if you guys know his work, but he's just kind of fabulous drawer of Deleuze. Um, we, the alteration that's internal to what we're going to mean by, I think we should mean by collaboration, entails thinking about collaboration as an assemblage, as paradox, as an assemblage without skin an alteration that skins the previous subjects without providing a new skin for the old. It's, we're going to have to get past that new wine. What is it called? New skin for new old wine for new skins? I can't remember. I'm not very good at that. The alteration is not the becoming of a new subject. It's not the becoming of a new social group. It's not the becoming of a new culture or organism. It's not the attenuation or accentuation of force. The alteration is, in fact, the investigation of becoming otherwise. That is, the alteration isn't even an object. It's an action. It's an investigation. And here the connotations of collaboration as betrayal of trust, of a traitorous deception, are really interesting. When we're thinking about the kind of alteration that I think should interest us, we, we, we should feel like there's that traitorous collaboration going on. I thought we were in one place. I thought we were one thing, even while you were in another place. I thought I was one thing, even as I was becoming another. But it's exactly how this dishinging or unhinging of bo bodies and bo boundaries and borders, that collaboration is alteration allows collaboration to turn into something more like investigation. That is, the kind of investigation that collaboration or alteration is not of what is, like how do we make these things that are, but rather how could this emergent thing do something, can it? And in investigating whether a new form can do something, or actually analyzing the given formation of social life. 
And in fact, I think this is the kind of collaboration that the Cotabing are engaged in. And I think it is the kind of collaboration the Cotabing are. As a member put it, this was just, it was a nana of mine, it was uh, uh, Natasha uh, Bigfoot, she, uh, just in, when was there, June. She said to me, she said, you know, Cotterbing only got one rule. We're very unruly. She has, we only have one rule. I said, really? <laughs> I didn't even know we had a rule. She said, yes, Cotterbing has one rule. I said, what's the rule? And she said, you have to do something to change something. And we all, I, this sounds like two rules to me, but anyways, you have to do something to change something, and we all have to decide together what that something is. A short genealogy of Cotterbing itself would suffice to see what she meant by that. What made the Cotterbing? Well, we can start by saying what, made, what initially made the GPS, this old media, digital media group. Actually, just this is another picture. Um, I should note that I, I said above that the Cotterbing Indigenous Corporation was composed of about 30 members and myself who were born and raised at Bellu and or we've known each other 30 years. So in 2007, when a group of people who had known each other a long time and were living at Bell Ewan, which is not Cotterbing, it's a place in the Northern Territory, when a riot broke out in the community and a group of families decided to leave their homes and well-paying jobs on the promise they'd be provided housing and jobs on a small outstation closer to what, according to the anthropological understanding of territory and descent group, consider their traditional country, that was a big mouthful. Anyways, when a riot broke out, they decided to go down there and they thought they'd get housing. I've written about this. When the funding didn't come through in a, in a significant part because the bureaucrats who promised it and hadn't actually done the budgetary homework, and then the government declared an intervention in indigenous governance in the north, part of which was halting all investment in indigenous communities, especially in the rural area, these displaced what we'd have to say Bellewin families, not Cotterbing, there was no Cotterbing, and I were left wondering what to do. So now they're homeless and displaced. How could they support their, themselves in their understanding of the world? That is their, and it's out of there sitting on a beach that this idea of a GPS, GIS, new digital virtual library emerged from their kids, who actually was a lot of people who were thinking tourism. And someone said, I can't stand standing in boats saying the same thing over and over to a tourist. It'd be great if we could just hand them a digital something. They could just listen to it themselves. And this idea then in turn produced the Cotabing. Remember, the Cotabing is not a term referring to a descent group or a territory. It refers instead, as I said, to the state of the tide at its lowest. We say Cotabing, it's right out. Why this term as an idea? Why did, why did this term become a concept. Is it a concept? By the time we were sitting out in the middle of the bush with no house or anything, and they were truly homeless, everyone had long experience with the machinery of the anthropologicalized bureaucracy of land rights and territory and descent groups. They knew if they picked a name of a place to encompass who they were, then they would exclude some people who were part of this mob but were not from the same place as the others. And they would include people who, under this territorial imagination, were from that name place, but not a part of who they are. If they picked a deceased person's name, a similar inclusionary and exclusionary force would result because of the way the world was already structured. Indeed, one of the underlying reasons for the initial riot or underlying frameworks inciting it was the divisions creating the Bellion community from a land claim. They considered themselves, you know what, I don't know what this picture's doing here. Whoa, okay, that's, I drew that. Okay, so anyways, that's a different kind of thing. Um, they, this is the Bellion community set up in 1950s. They were all born there in the 70s and 80s and considered themselves from there um, that a land claim then divided into, uh, I think this should play the, anything happening? Ah, good, is it moving? Good. 
the land claim, so that would be where the line was, was where they were born and raised, and then the land claim said, actually, no, you guys, that was the effect of colonialism, and you're really from these other countries. They themselves then struggled. They were phenomenologically one, but territorially many from, so from their perspective, they were one. From the states, they were many. What then was all of them, but nowhere in particular? That was her question. How do we get everybody, but not be anywhere in particular? Salt water. Everyone at that moment was born or saturated in salt water via a local distinction between three kinds of people in the world, fresh water, salt water, and desert. And the term captured, caught up being captured, an affective mood of the moment, that is, tied out, which doesn't have a negative connotation in Emmy angle. As noted on, we have a website, it's noted on the website, which they, we built together. There's nothing low about tod the tide reaching Kotabing, because when the tide goes out, you see all these reefs and all these possibilities emerge forward. So the Kotabing, and this is just actually, I probably should have shown this earlier. This is just the intervention I can talk about earlier. I've talked about it, and it all shows should play animation. Anything happening? Yep. Okay. So we can think about the Kotabing as a kind of intimate collaboration that was a concept meant to analyze or investigate the nature of late liberalism at the moment. Could a concept that was ecologically referential, but not territorially or dissent group enabled, be the basis for a making of a world? in the world that is currently structured. And this is just this crazy little diagram I made. That little red line is the Kotabing, which is the Kotabing as an intersection of forces and a divergence from state forces. That is, the Kotabing is the concept that works as a form of investigation, but it's also an alteration of the very bodies that are within it. And it's exactly this that the new media project, that GPS GIS project, made even though the digital project itself didn't come into the world. And nobody cares. That's what they wanted to make. Instead, in not having the funding to make this new digital library, they decided to put funds in a different, a smaller group of funds into a different project, which is exactly the film project, the second kind of collaboration. But here again, this form of media is not simply a collaboration. You know, I'm director, they're actors, we're all script writers, we bring in um, visiting directors, we bring in people who are good at, you know, know how to do various things we want to learn how to do. Rather, the films themselves, this kind of collaboration, is understood as a form of investigation that hopefully changes the very nature of the people collaborating in it. As I said, Kotabing films are written by the Kotabing, and the way they're written, I think we can begin to see what's at stake here. Kotabing films emerge from a simple observation about the contemporary lives of members. Someone will say, you know, we'll say, well, look, you know, what do we want to make a film about? Someone will say, you know, let's do something on losing our house from overcrowding. So, for instance, Kotabing have observed that in both city and bush life, um, both city and bush life is precarious in the wake of the federal intervention and the state treatment of indigenous people. And they observed that their kids struggle to make sense of how their family's cultural knowledge fits into contemporary understandings of evolution, the soundscapes of hip hop, and the technologies of land development like mining and house, uh, suburb building. The Kotabing then shape these observations into a plot. A family tries to find a missing relative but winds up stranded on their outstation. Well, how I described that first short. Or indigenous young adults struggle with how the dream may make sense in their contemporary lives how I described when the dogs talked. The elements of the plot are drawn from actual events. For the most part, everyone plays some version of him or herself, although a few Kotabing members play characters they have deep, intimate interaction with. For instance, uh, officers from, say, the Northern Territory Housing Commission. 
Everyone says or does things they said or done before, although these sayings and doings are put in a slightly different context. In other words, the Kadabing are acting even if they're acting themselves in their reality. And this deep grassroots reflection is then coupled to a transnational network of post-production and global networks of ed editors, sound designers, and colorists in the US and Europe, allowing the Kadabing then to thicken from internally and envision or vision themselves as spreading into a more global conversation. Thus, the Kadabing believe, believe that they are doing something in addition to analyzing the structure and nature of existing conflicts. They're keeping, but I should say, but they also think they're doing something other than just analyzing it. That is, we make a film and it analyzes and presents it in a narrative way. They believe they're doing something in addition to analyzing it. They're keeping the country alive by actually just acting on the country, not merely making a film representing their lives in the country, but paying attention to their country as they make a film in and about it. In other words, the Kadabing are both creating a filmic representation of their lives and actually having conversations about those lives and the country in it. In the act of making their films, like in the act if we did the GPS GIS project, in the act of making these things, they're making a space for themselves as they're making what they are becoming in the dusk of an impending northern territory buildup with sand flies and mosquitoes beginning to bite, an actual stomach churning, a headache in need of alleviation, worries about actual houses whose rent must be paid, as well as representing these ordinary conditions of carrying out one's obligations to other for people and country. Each of these collaborations both the ones, the, the GPS, which never, you would say, well, nothing ever came of it, became the Cotterbeing, became the film collective. Each of these collaborations as alteration and investigation seek to produce something. They seek, in other words, to make an expanding, norm making and expressing capacity for a group that isn't in existence yet. And what I wanted to do is because I have one paragraph left, but I wanted to try and just give you a sense of what I'm saying here by showing you a short clip. I think I, it's just gonna be two seconds. And because of, well, I don't know, the way these things are. I'm gonna start the sound, maybe you'll hear it, and then I'm gonna start the, the video and it's the sound trap will, will be off because I brought the wrong CD. Thing and well, I don't know. Whoops. Oh, wait, where to go? There. Can you hear anything? This is in When the Dogs Talked. Oh, I don't know why you're not seeing it. Oh, I know. Whoops. Wait. No, no, no. Oh, well, you definitely don't hear it. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Oh well, if you can't see it, you can't see it. Okay, well let me, let me close and see if we get this. Let me close by actually, because uh, for the most part I really wanted to just have a concrete example of the, for me at least, the complexity of, about what we mean when we just begin to think about collaboration and intimacy. Well, uh, you can't see it. Okay. Um, but I wanted to close by turning back to the conference and its actual object that is anthropology. I don't actually think about anthropology very much. I didn't first go to um, Australia as an anthropologist. I went to Australia on a fellowship um, right after uh, undergraduate land and I was a philosopher. And I became an anthropologist. I, I've written about this other way, but it's important for collaboration. I became an anthropologist because they needed an anthropologist, the folks at Bellion needed an anthropologist for a land claim they were running. No, we'll wait till, we'll wait one second. So they asked me whether, you know, would I become a lawyer? And I said no. And um, I really do want to become a lawyer. And they said, what about anthropologists? We need one of th those too. I said, I really don't know what that is. They said, you seem clever enough. I bet you can figure it out. I said, okay. So in many ways, I myself am a, the kind of alteration that I think the kind of collaboration we want to talk about, I am that kind of alteration. 
But what about anthropology as a discipline? Something I don't think much about, but have been a little bit. After all, from what I can tell by reading the organizers' intentions, the question is, or one question could be, as I started this talk with, can the concept of collaboration get us out of the dead ends anthropology has found itself in? And then they list a bunch of them. That is, nihilistic postmodernism, structural functionalism, etc. Is collaboration, or in the way I understand collaboration, collaboration as alteration and investigation of concepts new? Is it something new to this discipline? Is it something that will revolutionize our discipline? Or was, as Talal Assad said many years ago now, when talking about colonialism and anthropology, that social anthropology was not primarily a handmaiden to colonial administration, not because it was somehow enlightened when it came into being, but because it had within itself, always, within itself contained a set of profound contradictions and ambiguities. And therefore, anthropology, according to Talal, had a, the potential for transcending itself. What I find interesting is whether or not this discipline, and I'm not a big booster, but whether or not as we turn toward collaboration as the soul for this discipline, whether we should remember that collaboration was already in it, although not in a radicalized form. What do I mean? Let's go to Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Brana, uh, Malinowski's foundational statement on the methods that would define this discipline, or the discipline he was helping to establish. And you can remember his three principles. First, an anthropologist must maintain an absolute separation from his kind. His kind, I'm just quote. Second, the anthropologist must be intimately immersed in the imponderability of local life. And finally, the anthropologist must organize what he observes into scientific tables. The question is not what these methods were then, nor even what they are now in the wake of a numerous critiques, that is, we've long ago shown that the separation was a fantasy of power, and science, in some way, critical ways, have given, has given way to writing. The question is not what it was then, in actuality. The question is what were the profound contradictions and ambiguities that existed within these methods that allowed us to see what was always present but never actualized. These contradictions and ambiguities built in the heart of that method were, I think, exactly the collaboration as alteration, collaboration as investigation, and investigation as alteration that the actual investigator simply refused to acknowledge. Thank you. Do we have two seconds to show you, like two minutes? Okay. Well, the reason I want to show you this is that um, uh, the, the, way, the way we shoot these, these films, um, as I said, we, the, the actual scenes, we try, you know, someone comes up with, I want to investigate X, Y, or Z. So, like the one we're doing now about the uh, younger men stealing this beer and, you know, running into a swamp, that was, that the younger men came out, that's what they want to do. And it's like, okay. Um, we were like, okay, and then we put it together. Uh, th this, was the, this was the longer version of what was initially a short. And the way we shoot the films, uh, sorry, the way we script the films is that we uh, use, base it on things that have actually happened or have been said. And, but in slightly different arrangements. So what you see is not exactly what happened, but everything 
that initially is said in the scene, although you can't hear it, you're going to have to read the subtitles, um, uh, was said. And so what we would do is we set up the camera and we set up these, and this is the kids themselves, and we set up the kids. And then we say, you, when you first came here, you said this. When you first came here, you said that. When you first came here, you said that. When you first came here, you said that. So what we're going to do is that everyone just say it first and then keep having the argument. So where they are, they're going to the, they're going to the dog dreaming, which is this hill um, with a set of water wells. And this shows what happens in the course of filming and the kind of alteration that occurs as a kind of investigation. And I, I can talk about it later, but let me just show it to you. Let me see. I, supposedly I can make the sound work, but I don't know. I'm frightened. Okay, if I do that. Why are we getting the water? If we could just use your boat, no, no, go no, around no, the Darwin, no. and on our way back we can... Okay, okay we're just going to go with soundless. Anyways, that's uh, the station manager. They see them, um, the group going under a fence to get, because this place is inside uh, a pastoral station. I'm sorry, you could hear it. parent. Oh, we should get here. I wish you could hear that little kid, he's so funny. That's what I actually wanted you to hear. That's uh, Sheree Bionamu, and she's the one, she says, um, it's not funny, it's real, it's real. And by that time, we had just been rolling the camera, and I'm going, keep going, guys. And so this conversation, it's cut, but there's a big conversation starts, and they really start fighting each other about whether this makes sense, and then, all of them just took the positions they took. We didn't assign any position after that first round. And at some point, when everyone is really, really going after Cherie, she says, it's not funny. It's real. It's real. I don't know what was real. I've asked Sherry, what was real? She said, I don't know. It's just some huge feeling that happened. That's the alteration. That's kind of this divergence that be could become something and lead to something else, that the kind of collaboration is intimate alteration. Um, that's the kind of collaboration I think we need. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Beth. We've um, we started late, um, and we do have to clear this 
this room. Um, so, but we'll, we, we're going to take, um, best agree to take about four questions, if they can be short. But more to the point, your answers will have to be short. <laughs> okay, so um, there'll be people walking around with microphones. Thank you very much. I have a short question about the term collaboration. In other languages, the term is about contam contamination. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Can you say something about that? Yeah, there's, um, well, we're, when we're in, in both Creole and ME, where the languages we speak in Australia, we use, in Creole, we use the phrase, get up for each other is what's closest to collaboration or kakantherikaru. So it means like you look at who gets up. Um, in English, uh, indeed, the, one of the connotations of, or the, of um, collaboration is exactly that which is the, the idea of the traitor and rather than seeing that, rather than saying, oh, well, look, collaboration has a positive and a negative valence. That is, that the good politics are collaboration as this kind of internal alteration. The bad politics are the traitorous, right? I actually think that it's the wrong way to think it through. I think that the kind of collaboration that alters fundamentally um, the parts that are coming together and end up making these divergences and open-endedness is exactly a form of traitorness, I don't know, right? In which you absolutely, you, you, you find that you are something that you weren't when you started. Um, and you find yourself obligated to something that didn't exist before you started. That doesn't mean you just have no stance toward that. You, 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 know, you still work on it. But it's, a, it's, it's thinking about collaboration outside of certain, you know, from a certain kind of liberal, let's come together and work together toward a you know, more just society. And it's like, no, actually, in a robust understanding of collaboration, I really think we need the traitorous aspect, because that's what we're doing. We're becoming traitorous to what is in the world. Does that, hopefully, that makes what you're doing. Someone shouted over here. That's fine. Oh, upstairs. Oh, hi. Sorry, I didn't see you at that. I can hear you. It's just really short. How, um, how would you, I mean, would you make the same argument talking about participation movements rather than collaboration? I'll say it again. Absolutely not alterity, alteration. Yeah, alteration and alterity are really different things. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I hate did you, partic did you get it? Sorry. Yeah, I got it. The All question right. is whether uh, I, whether I would use the term participation rather than collaboration. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't use collaboration. Um, but I did think it was a very interesting, um, sorry, this light shining my eye. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting pro pr uh, provocation to think through. And I do think it, it presents me with a much richer some concept to work with than participation. Um, I'm participating. I'm not, you know, really? No. 
I mean, maybe, maybe what, what I want to say, I think collaborations implies many other layers of engagements in film practices, yeah. and often, especially in literature, yeah. in, you know, the, the way in which actors of, you know, real people are part of the process, you yeah. know, is, is being often defined as a participatory process as well. Yeah. Therefore, right. if it's participations, you know, like the same argument that I'm making can work perhaps, I don't know, and I wonder whether it would work for you. Well, you know, it, no, what process. I really found, again, working with the organizers of this conference, what I really found interesting about collaboration is that these both projects really are t intended to not simply take various people and have them participate. Rather, the intention is to produce something that's not there or is or has to be maintained because the forces are continually trying to uh, 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 dissolve them. So, the is it participatory? Yeah, and some. Yeah, of course. I mean, everybody. It, it's they're made deeply together, um, with a lot of sense. Everybody knows each other pretty well, with real attention to, you know, what so and so and so and so and so and so is good at or desires to do, even if they're not so good at it. But the point is to change what exists, not simply to bring little pieces together and have it have them participate with each other. I find participation a very weak word, but I find collaboration potentially a really interesting one. So what, what, what became after the making of, um, of this interaction wasn't there when it started and that's what the film was intended to do. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you very much. I, I just, um, well, two things. First, for me, collaboration, and, and here I think I speak on behalf of many of the Eastern European comrades here in the room, yeah. means something else, especially next to revolution. Right. Yeah, so uh, I would yeah, like no. you to refer to that also because I think there is, in this field that you're describing, the only point of power of, or of interaction with any power is the anthropologist him or herself. So, so the power, the state, you know, any kind of uh, even capital, like some states stay out of the picture of the collaboration that you presented. And then the second thing that I'm curious of, because, you know, I work with academics. And there, like, I think the, the model that you present is wishful, but it is still about reproducing otherness. Because in my work with academics, there is no possibility for, you know, this collaboration. You need another that, that doesn't have, you know, the power position that you have within the field in order to participate or to collaborate with you in this. Because uh, with academics there is a kind of push, like there is no possibility for collaboration, there is no possibility for even objectification on my behalf as an anthropologist, there is no possibility for collaboration because there is a very shared power in, in an academic community and it is not possible to come into this very um, nice, I guess, um, I would say interaction that you describe. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. So, so the nice interaction in anthropology? Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm not interested actually in collaborating in anthropology and that might be, no, but I think it's actually, it, it, it's a, for me at least an important, I shouldn't say that as flippantly as I do, but I think for me it's an interesting point because the kind of thing I'm trying to talk about is not something necessarily that you just can endlessly do every which way. You have to decide where you're doing it. it. For me at least, it takes up a huge amount of time as it does with the people are, you know, the carbine. So, so for me at least, it's like, well, where do I want to, in a limited amount of, uh, you know, this kind of space time, where do I want to do it? And I, d I don't, I, I just bluntly don't want to, if I had a choice, don't want to do it in, in anthropology. I didn't really want to come here. <laughs> I wanted to come here because I had never been to Estonia. Um, but it's the middle of when I can be in Australia. And when I'm here, then, you know, what we can do together there is, is attenuated. Um, I can't tell if you're saying, look, I'm, I personally am powerful or there's a hierarchy of power in the academy? Absolutely. 
yeah, no, totally, absolutely. Um, and I will just, yes, there is, and it's part and parcel about actually what Cottabing and I talk about because I lay that out and I lay out the financial nature of that and th we have an agreement that everything I make doing this kind of stuff goes into that. So all of it has to be woven in. Do I like, to, you know, do I want to talk about that much? No, why? Because it's like, oh, look at me, I fold everything into 